Okay, so let me declare the end of the break and the beginning of the second session. Our keynote speaker here is Professor Nikolaus Forgo from the University uh, of Vienna. Uh, Professor Forgo specializes in IT and IP law. Uh, the field of his research includes e-commerce as well as internet and data protection law. Professor Forgo is at the moment the head of the Department of Innovation and Digitalization in Law at the University of Vienna. He studied law, philosophy, and linguistics in Vienna and Paris. And in the past, he was also the head and the founder, I guess, of the Institute for Informat Informatics and Law in the University of Hanover in, in Germany. Uh, please let me just add that I met Professor Fogo many, many years ago when we were both very young legal theorists. And since then, Professor Fogo got involved into the fascinating field of uh, computer science and law. And I got involved into the boring administrative stuff that I did it now. And this is precisely the reason why Professor Fogo is the keynote speaker today. Uh, me, so I <laughs> give the floor to Nicola. <laughs> this is precisely the reason why you are organizing this. <laughs> so I'm part of the show, but I'm not running the show. So thank you very much for having me here. Uh, actually, you know, people like me, uh, when they come to opportunities like this, start to talk about themselves. This is what the most is like the most. So I need to start to talk about myself at the beginning, but uh, as this is boring, I've brought a little film with me that you can see on the right side of the screen. So what you see here is the university championship in uh, robotics and sumo in Japan. So those are all of those are robots. Uh, all of them follow the very simple rules of sumo, which is try to get the other one out of the ring. Um, and uh, this is done every year uh, in, in Japan. Um, and I would just, when you listen to me, suggest to you that you imagine how this sumo fight would look like if uh, each of those little robots uh, had a size which would be a hundred times larger than, uh, than uh, this one here. Um, important to say, each of them uh, run autonomously, so there is no person uh, doing this. It's the machine, per se. Okay, so I so look at this and listen to me. Um, I was born in 1968, um, so uh, on the 27th of May, 1968, which is an important date because on the 25th um, of May of 2018, so two days before I uh, became 50 years old, an important event happened in Europe, which was that GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, became applicable. And since then, I've constantly been doing the joke that this is the perfect gift that you can get uh, for your 50th birthday, because it guarantees that you will uh, have nothing else to talk about for the rest of your professional career, uh, because of the, uh, the very slow development, uh, the, uh, the technological, legal uh, landscape takes in Europe. Um, that, was, um, that was true in May 2018. Since then, I'm not that sure any longer whether this is really the perfect birthday present. Um, but I will talk a little bit more about this in the further process of this speech. Um, when I was born, uh, in 1968, uh, computers looked like this. Uh, this is a picture from 1968. And it's an image that I like very much for many, many reasons. Um, the first reason um, why I like it is that this very, you know, sentimental-looking man looking somewhere into the future uh, is not really running the machine. Just for the younger people in the room, this is a phone. Okay, this is how the telephones look like, and this is the machine. So he is looking somewhere in the future. The only woman in the room that is not really interested in what's going to happen. But the, the, the main message here is it's huge, right? It's huge and it's expensive. And this is just 50 years ago. So this is, I mean, you see me and you see the development since then. When I, when I was 15, uh, so in my, uh, in my high school years, some, something rather important happened then, uh, which looked like this. I do hope that this works now.
December 1983. Uh, the claim was 1984 won't be like 1984, and the machine that was advertised to this looked like this. Right? So this is the machine we are talking about. Two or three important innovations. One is the mouse. The second one is it has uh, a floppy disk, 1.2 megabyte storage capacity on one of those disks. By the way, less than each of the pictures that you take today. Uh, needs. But the important thing for people like me was then this was something you could afford, right? Many people could afford this machine, and many people could then have some kind of basic computer power at home. And it's interesting that exactly in this year, even exactly in this month, so late 1983, when this advertisement was screened, the German Constitutional Court had to deal with a very specific case, which was about the German public census then in 1983, run by forms that looked very much like this. This is the form, a lot of paper, very few information, a lot of paperwork that needed to be done. And however, that was the moment when the German Constitutional Court one could say found, one could also say developed a new constitutional right, a fundamental right, which is the, the right to, fundament, to informational self-determination. In 1983, the German court then said that, in, uh, that it, there is a necessity to establish this fundamental right of informational self-determination because individuals need to ascertain, need to be the possibility to ascertain who knows what about them. And if this would not be guaranteed, so in, in a social order in which individuals can no longer ascertain who knows what about them, this would be um, uh, not compatible with this right to information and self information, which is an elementary prerequisite for the functioning of a free democratic society predicated on the freedom of action and participation of its members. The problem, however, for the Constitutional Court in Germany in 1983 was that there was no such thing like a fundamental right to information and self determination in the German Constitution, which came from 1949, as you certainly know, no computers developed yet. So what the German Constitutional Court then did was that it found this right to informational self-determination in the very heart of the German Constitution in Article 1 and in Article 2, Section 1 of the German Grundgesetz, the Constitution. And Article 1, just to remind you, is about human dignity. It's the principle human dignity is inviolable. So this right, this right to information and self-determination from 1983, when I was 15 years old, was founded and was established on, in the core, in the heart, in the center of the German legal system, in Article 1 and Article 2 of uh, the Grundgesetz. Since then, obviously, machines look very different and forms look very different. However, since then, and this is probably the first claim that I would like to make in this argument, uh, since then, one basic principle has not changed. And this principle has something to do with GDPR that I already mentioned. What I would like to share with you in the next slide is the first comment that I ever read on one specific right that was introduced by GDPR, which is the so-called right to be forgotten. 
The idea behind that was that Europeans should have the right to be forgotten by machines. That was a rather weird concept for non-Europeans when it entered the scene. And one of the commentaries that I read very early about this is this one here. That's an American academic writing about the right to be forgotten. And the first sentence or the second sentence that you can read in the abstract is this one here. Europeans have a long tradition of declaring abstract privacy rights in theory that they fail to enforce in practice. And my impression is that this is, in a way, the guiding principle of my personal career and my personal life. And I would like to share this frustrating experience uh, with you in the next 20 minutes. Um, by one statement to edit, which is this. This is how computers look like today when I'm 15 years old. Um, this is a screenshot that looks, in my view, very similar to the one that we saw before from 1968. It's again two men, unfortunately less elegantly um, um, uh, looking like, uh, but still two men, no women, still huge machines, right? The major difference is this is no longer owned by the state. That's difference one. Difference two, those machines are no longer in Europe. The screenshot that you see here is from a YouTube video in which Google explains why it's safe to use Google storage capacities using Google Cloud services. And the reason why this gentleman is in this film, he, he wears a uniform, I don't know whether you see this, he wears a uniform, and he doesn't talk during the whole video. He's only here because he's the one who needs to convince you that Google Storage is safe, right? So he is the guy being uh, behind your data. Uh, and still, you are not really, 50 years later, you are not really in control of what happened. In between this, so between my birth and my 50s, um, my 50th birthday, there was a short period of anonymity, I would call, something which was weird. And we started somewhere when I was 25, and which was like this. This is something I really want the younger people in the room to listen to in its whole length, because what you hear here now is a modem trying to connect to the internet in 1995. And this is what you needed to do if you wanted to get access on the internet. And this is important because, in my view, this is the sex. So now you are online, right? <laughs> 26 kilobits or something per second. You are terribly expensive. You could not use your phone. You needed to be in front of the computer, and so on and so on. But this is another second important moment in my life. So the first one was somewhere in 1983 when I first had the computer, the personal computer. This is the second important moment. This is when you first had the internet. And there, there was a very short window then open uh, of, I would call it, anarchy. So people felt some kind of freedom and, and opportunities. And people started to claim that it would be important to, to uh, save this freedom. One of the important players in this game was then um, the, the gentleman that you uh, would see, could see here at least in part. That's John Perry Barlow. John Perry Barlow, one of the founding members of the um, um, civil rights movement in the US, uh, the Internet Frontiers Foundation, who then in 1996, so quite um, recently after this year, uh, wrote a declaration of the independence of cyberspace. This is the main reason by John Perry Barlow is well known. In this declaration of the independence of cyberspace, he declared cyberspace, the internet, whatever um, you might call it, he called it uh, independent. Because, as he said, uh, the governments, the traditional governments, had no sovereignty when those new independent um, um, habitants of the cyberspace space would gather. And as he argued in 1996, your, meaning your government's legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. They are all based on matter, and there is no matter here. This was the scandal that was prominently discussed at conferences, uh, meetings, university, strategy, uh, etc. when I and Thomas, when we were young, when we were young academics, this was the scandal. This was the, 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 the pain in the flesh um, of European, and not only European, 
government. And the reaction on this was, on the one hand, that lawyers like Lawrence Lessig uh, started to enter the scene arguing that law was one important but not the only important factor when it comes to, uh, the, um, uh, to, to the, the question how behavior on the internet is governed, so that it's not only law. Fam uh, Lessig became widely famous for his statement that is mainly uh, something he calls architecture or code that is also governing the law. So the book I'm talking about is this famous book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, that was published in 1999. So that was one of the outcomes of this, that uh, European and non-European academics started to think about the architecture. The second outcome, however, what looks like this, that everything that happened since then in the law has not really helped European players in, in staying independent in this very futuristic sense uh, that John Perry Barlow meant. The world today looks more like this. This is, this is now for the younger people in the room. This is your youth now, which is no longer one minute of connection that you need and no longer the, the claim that if you do this, you are independent and nobody can govern you. You can be on my own the time, but the people and the institutions governing you are, um, are quite a few, and they are quite powerful. Let me talk very briefly about the power. Um, what you will see in a second uh, is uh, Mark Zuckerberg answering uh, in um, a hearing at the European Parliament after uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So just to put this, uh, these 10 seconds in context, this here is the symbol of the, of the European people. It's, it's the leading members of the European Parliament interviewing Zuckerberg in the Parliament, right? In the very first sentences, and believe me, I'm quite sure that every single word that Zuckerberg is saying was checked before he did. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this is the opening statement of Zuckerberg in the European Parliament, in front of the members of the European Parliament, trying to interview him on the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And that's what he says. President Tajani, honorable members of the European Parliament, it's good to be back in Europe. Thank you for inviting me here today for this important discussion. Now, Europeans make up a large and incredibly important part of our global community. And many of the values that Europeans care about deeply are values that we share. Well, it's good to be back in Europe, Papa. Uh, Europeans make up a large and incredibly important part of our global community. Many of the values that Europeans care about deeply are values that we share. And I ask you, just rhetorically, but I still ask you, would that be something you would expect as an opening statement of someone who is part of your jurisdiction or part of your legislative authority? So is this the way you would expect someone uh, to behave uh, who is following the rules that are coming from your institution, which is the European Parliament. In my reading, this is more like a statement of a state president or somebody representing an authority just like another public um, authority driven by international public law. Uh, so it's more like a meeting of statespersons than, uh, than a CEO being interviewed. And this is something which I would like to um, share with you, um, which is an impression that I more and more have, which is that state authorities and state representation is eroding in particular in Europe. Another very recent example of this is, um, this is just a recall, uh, this is the Twitter account of a German police authority, just an average German police authority, not really important, you know, one of the police departments thinking that it's a good idea to have a Twitter account tweeting about the law. The interesting part of this is the account is blocked by Twitter because the police authority might have behaved strangely, right? Which in this case, by the way, was that they did not tweet for several weeks. Right? That is something that Twitter sees as something um, which is strange. And the outcome of this is that the police is no longer able to tweet because Twitter 
blocked uh, the access. And the third example, um, being an excerpt from the Google Transparency Report um, on, uh, on, on the right to be forgotten that I mentioned already. Uh, and this is the only information that you receive on this transparency report on Poland and how requests of Polish authorities are dealt with. And this is typical in a way because the only information that you receive after hundreds of thousands of requests and hundreds of thousands of deletions is the following. We received a request from a prominent person on TV who is now mostly behind the scenes in the media industry to remove 115 addresses from Google Search that link to articles that relate to previous TV work the data subject is mentioned. And then the answer, the, the outcome of the legal analysis of this is we have not removed the addresses because the person concerned is still a figure in public life and is still active in the universe. If an independent academic like Thomas or me or any of you would be interested to analyze what exactly is going on here, we would be stuck because this is the only information that we receive. Obviously, Google follows all kinds of internal thoughts on this, internal interests on this, we are excluded from. So no transparency, no publicity, no public control. Another example of erosion of uh, public uh, authority. Austria, by the way, is even worse. Uh, in this transparency report, in the case of Austria, Google even reports that the data protection authority, so public authority, has asked for the deletion. And again, they did not remove the deletes, right? So just to <coughs> re-emphasize uh, this, an authority asks a public player, I'm uh, sorry, a private company to do something. And the outcome of that is not only that the, public, uh, the private player does not follow this, but they do not even explain why they do not follow this. And it's not possible for anyone to, um, to analyze why they do not follow this. So the, the main message of this is we have had a technological development starting somewhere in 1983 and then again in 1995, which is very distinct from the legal development leading to a situation which looks like this, which is erosion of state authority. I could go into some details on this. I will not go uh, for time reasons, but I will give a share with you how I think, how my reading is of how the European Commission, the European legislator has reacted on this since 2010, so in your younger people in the room, smartphone. Since 2010, uh, the European Commission is again very active in reorganizing the scene from a regulatory perspective. Just like in 1995, when we were young academics, when all these data protection directive, data, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the electronic communications packages, electronic signatures, copyright, and all these directives, and e-commerce entered the scene between 1995 and 2000. We see quite the same now since 2010, starting with something which was then called Digital Agenda in 2010, coming with one major argument, which is Europe is technologically behind. We need to speed up, we need to be better than this. And 10 years later, now, in 2019, the upcoming president and now active president of uh, the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, is still of the same opinion, which is we need to speed up and we need to do this by regulatory means. In one of the very few documents that are publicly available at the moment about what we might expect from this presidency and from this commission, this one here has rather strong claims to make on the digital agenda, now saying that it may be too late to, this is from the line speaking now, right? It may be too late to replicate hyperscalers, meaning Twitter, Google, Facebook, and others, but not European companies. But it is not too late to achieve, and now she calls something technological sovereignty. Technological sovereignty. You remember that Barlow in 1996 speaks about sovereignty and that governments don't have the sovereignty among the members of the cyberspace futuristic world. So she speaks again about technological sovereignty in some critical technology areas. One of them being, please remember the robots in my very first slide, one of them being um, artificial intelligence. And what she claims here is that in her first 100 days in office, so somewhere in March 2020, just to remind you, this is very, very close to today. In my first 100 days in office, she will put forward legislation for a coordinated European approach on the human and ethical implications 
of artificial intelligence. So again, I ask you rhetorically, what would you expect the European Commission to propose until March 2020 solving the human and ethical implications of artificial intelligence? Third quote from this, she also then states that this initiative is part of a, of a broader concept, which is digitalization and cyber are two sides of the same coin. What does that mean? What does this starts with a different mindset mean? And we need to move from a need to know to a need to share um, understanding. I must confess, I do not understand anything of this. Mm -hmm. I, I've been working in this field now for 25 years. I have no clue what she's talking about. And I would be very, very uh, keen to hear how you interpret this and what exactly this means, again, in the context, as I said, of regulation of the big topics that we have at the moment, artificial intelligence, robotics, and all those buzzwords that you are very familiar with. Um, Europe, has been behind, Europe was behind in 2010. Europe, bad message to deliver, is still behind. These are figures now coming from the European Commission about how Europe is doing in comparison with other major economic areas in the world. So in, to put this into context, this is part of an official publication of the European Commission. So it's very unlikely that those figures are too pessimistic when it comes to European players, right? Probably or possibly they are over optimistic, but still Europe again is behind according to these figures and Europe is dramatically behind. Um, just two or three examples on this. This is um, um, a score that uh, is attributed um, to uh, Europe by this institution every year trying to measure uh, the digital skills and the digital fitness of Europe in comparison with other societies in the world. Um, and the interesting, and this is the average, this is where Europe um, in average stands. This here are the bottom four countries, and this here are the top four. So interestingly, uh, Europe is not in the lead even in its top countries, and Europe is clearly not in the lead when it comes to the average. And Europe has a real problem when we are in the bottom field, right? We are close to Russia here and right in front of China when it comes to digital skills. China, by the way, is of course growing very quickly, whereas Europe, as you will see in a second, is not doing that well. Um, within Europe, by the way, the same problem like 2010 still appears, which is that we have a clear north, south, and west, east gap here. Uh, so the northern countries in the lead. Uh, this is Poland, by the way. Um, so quite um, in, in the bottom field, this is Austria, uh, also not really being one of the leading countries. The leading countries clearly are north and west, right? Um, so it's a big spread still after more than 10 years of regulation. Uh, and the average and the bottom is not really doing well, although we have seen a lot of regulations and not a lot of new rules, in particular since 2010, not really having any impact on the economical development. Again, um, this is the average of Europe. Um, this here is the bottom. Um, and if you take those two, you see no real difference to any of the other economic uh, big economic areas, including South Korea, Japan, and the USA. So uh, although we do a lot in regulation, uh, since 2010 in particular, no real outcome uh, in, in, in the hard facts. <coughs> and more importantly, more and more of trends that uh, Europe is, is, is losing. These are the top 15, uh, the top 15 uh, IT players in the world in 2018. Not a single one of them uh, being European anymore. So, end of story. No European company in, in this field. Um, and that is, I think, a kind of problem. I would like to uh, talk a little bit about that problem, um, if, if I may, in the remaining minutes. Um, the problem is uh, identified obviously not only by me, but also by an institution which is called ENISA, European Network Information Security Agency, 
which is a European agency funded by the European Union dealing with information security, um, having its headquarter in Concrete, uh, writing all kinds of reports. This is the, a recent one uh, that I would like to share with you because of this. This is the security analysis of a European agency on where we stand in Europe. It's a kind of a hamburger. Um, and uh, Europe is the party in the middle, um, being um, under pressure of the Chinese Asian hardware industry and laying on top of the US software industry, meaning content and software. And, and this is the place remaining um, um, where, where all the regulations that, um, that I could speak about here um, uh, play a role. Um, just one recent example, uh, I talked about this when I came here with Emily, who was kind enough to, uh, so kind to, to meet me at the lobby of the hotel. One example of this situation from last week, um, this is a lobbying letter that was sent to um, the members of the German parliament, the Bundestag, last week by Telefonica, which is one of the major phone service and electronic communication service providers in Germany, not a hardware seller, they are selling the product which is connectivity, about whether or not it would be a good idea to exclude Huawei from, um, uh, from uh, participating in the development of 5G hardware technology solutions in Europe in general and in Germany in particular. So what you see here is a lobbying letter coming from a European software provider or communication provider lobbying for a Chinese hardware provider to still use Huawei products because if that would not happen, the costs of not having Huawei would be, according to this letter, 55 billion euro, 55 billion euro just for not using Huawei and a delay in getting 5G on the consumer market of at least 18 months. 18 months of delay, 55 billion euro costs, and Telefonica then lobbying uh, in, the, in the German parliament that that would not be affordable, that therefore it would be necessary to use Chinese technology. This is the party we are in, right? Or we are at the moment. So, uh, the legal development with this, so this was now more what I see from my personal history and my biography. The legal development of this, however, as I said, has been very active in particular since 2018, but as I would like to argue now, very, very uh, disconnected from the technological and the societal uh, environment. And let me just stress this a little bit further by uh, GDPR, which at least in the legislations I'm familiar with, uh, had a huge impact on, on, the, on, on, on the understanding of, of data protection law in the sense that suddenly data protection law uh, and this right to informational determination and all, come, all the things coming with this suddenly became part of the day-to-day -day communication. Which was in a kind, which was very funny for me because when I started my academic work, I was, you know, a rather weird person, somewhere close to, I mean, very strange things I was working with, and suddenly everybody started to talk um, about this. Uh, as I said, in particular since 25th of May 2018, because there was this huge new law arguing that it would be one continent, one law, fit for the internet, and one size fits all approach coming, not really fulfilling any of these promises, as I would like to argue if you want me in the debate afterwards, but coming with huge, huge fines. So the, the main change is this one here, higher penalties and higher fines. Uh, that were seen. All the rest is not true. Not internet fit, not one continent, one law. Not really one size fits all. One little tiny detail on this, this is the situation as we see it today when it comes to the age limit children need to have in order to be allowed to independently sign on, on a social media website. Right? And those of you having children, 
like me, having two of them know that this is part of the day-to-day -day communication, in particular during Sunday breakfast. Am I allowed to use, I don't know, TikTok independently or Snapchat or whatever, Instagram independently? And the father or the mother, they argue, no, you should not, because it's evil, you know, the baby boomer argument. Um, so the answer to this, should or should not they be allowed to decide on this independently? This is the one continent, one law answer. Uh, Europe gives on this. There is no age limit between 13 and 16 that is not used in one of the countries. I don't know whether this is appropriate, but Poland is really 13, whether this is true. According to this, it's 13. In Austria, it's 14. Some other countries have 16, and we have everything in between. That is a tiny detail. I mean, it's probably not only important, not really important, just if you are a father or a mother, that might be important. There are other areas in GDPR where I could draw the same that are certainly more important than this. One example for this would be, in how far should it be allowed to use data that is already existing for research purposes? That is obviously a huge problem. Does a medical clinic uh, have the right to use existing treatment data for research, question mark? And again, the same answer would be, this is subject to member state law. So no continent, no one continent, one law, not only when it comes to age limits of children, but in every single, more or less every single important detail, such as in this one, no change. And that caused some kind of crisis. You know, on the one hand, these fines and this complexity and this irrelevance produced some kind of GDPR crisis, I would say. And that is one of the very last arguments that I would make. The word GDPR, or its German translation, which is that which was called for, them, was elected in 2018 in an election by a scientific society as the worst new word in the German language, as the least popular new word in the German language. So the no, no, no go word in 2018 because of this you know, crisis that I'm describing. So this is the, uh, the, the reasoning of the jury, roughly speaking, saying, uh, it's bureaucratic, it's expensive, it, 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 it hits the wrong people. Okay? The reaction of the European Commission on this was the following. The Commission came up with, or, or on, on this trend, not exactly on this, but on this trend of crisis, uh, looked like this. This is a screenshot from um, a policy paper uh, of, um, of the European Commission again about why GDPR was a success. This is the attempt of the Commission to explain to us GDPR is a success story. It's not true that it should be the least popular word. It's a successful attempt of the European legislator to solve the problem. I'm quite aware that you can't read this. This is on purpose, because I want to ask you rhetorically what you think that this might be. You see, it's a kind of a fever curve here that you see. And the, the purpose of this paper is to explain why GDPR is a success. So what could be, what could this be about when it is a success story of GDPR written by the European Commission? So very easy. This is a fever curve showing how many people searched for GDPR on Google around 25th of May. So this is the blue line here in comparison with Beyoncé and Kim Kardashian. So just for the young, all the people in the room, these are the competitors, right? So GDPR is a success because during the peak month of May 2018, people looked even more intensely about GDPR than Beyoncé being the orange line and Kim Kardashian being the white one. This is the, uh, the argument, okay, this is the argument. And the argument then against this argument could be that this is the outcome. I don't know whether you know anything about what that figures could be. I don't, I will tell you, I will tell you. This is the amount of pages in the Austrian, just in the Austrian official journal, trying to translate GDPR into the Austrian national system. 331 pages of national law implementing this into our legal system. If you multiply this with 28 member states, and within the member states, and perhaps with some regions, because some, yeah, some jurisdictions in Europe, as you know, have different regional data protection laws, 
or and you multiply this then again with uh, let's say in Germany for example 17 regions and, and in theory that might lead into a situation where you have 150,000 pages of national translation of one continent one low GDPR attempt so um, this is the situation and my lesson uh, to this is or my message to this is this is, I have a bet with myself, which is that I show this slide now for more than, I think, five years in every single presentation that I give, because it always fits and it's the only message, which is we are failing in Europe with the legislative approach that we have been choosing for the last 15 or 20 years, because the laws become more and more complex. They are later and later coming, and they are becoming more and more irrelevant. So the approach that we have been choosing so far in regulating this field of information technology um, in Europe has been fair. And still, second message, more of this approach to come. Uh, the most prominent example would be probably the privacy regulation, but also the evidence and the electron, European electronic communication code would be uh, uh, examples for this. So what should we do then? <coughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I would, however, like to share one approach with you, which is again the approach of the uh, ENISA, the Electronic European Network Information Security Agency, the Patty and Hamburger picture source. So, what they propose is the following. First, they say uh, we, we can't regulate if there's nothing left to regulate. In an increasingly globalized world, Europe has often presented itself as a champion of values. However, the EU's normative power alone cannot guarantee the digital sovereignty, again, the digital sovereignty, you remember that word, of its citizens or its businesses. To regain its influence and, its shed, and shed its status as an ICT industry likely, Europe needs to deliver European champions in the ICT sector that succeed in the marketplace. So the answer is, it's the economy, stupid, right? We need to do something about the economy here and not about regulating things that are no longer present here. We need to incentivize economic solutions. The conclusion they give is, governments need to act as a stimulus and not as an inhibitor to this progress. In an increasingly interconnected world, the European ICT sector should be strengthened and stimulated to improve its competitiveness in the global marketplace as well as in the domestic marketplace. They also give a set of rather precise recommendations then. In, I would like to highlight just three of them. Competition law being one of the fields that are really interesting at the moment. Facebook and others being subject to competition and antitrust law um, um, procedures all over the world, that would be one possible answer. Second one, reduction of regulatory barriers and administrative burdens for European ICT purposes, uh, businesses, sorry. And third, a long-term strategy for building and maintaining a cyber-skilled Europe, meaning education, education, education. Thank you very much. Nicolas, for a fascinating speech. Uh, I opened the Q&A part. I would like to be the first question maker. So I, I was the first. So uh, uh, did I understand correctly that, that uh, you would agree with this suggestion uh, uh, by Anissa that, that uh, the uh, lagging behind of Europe in terms of technological development and, let's say, um, economic success of this kind of industry in the global market is the uh, um, it's mainly due to this overregulation, uh, mainly you know on the on the basis of European law because I understand that you know this is actually uh, no I, I I don't I'm not sure whether Enisa makes this argument and I'm not sure whether I make this argument I I don't I'm not sure I I would not really like to argue that because of the overcomplicated regulation we are lagging behind yeah. because I think that it is just one factor and it's more a symptom than the reason I think uh, 
we are lagging behind because we have uh, not seen, we have a long tradition of being afraid of what's coming and all the risks and all the problems coming. And one of the symptoms of this is that we try to mitigate those risks by legal means, such as the GDPR, which is a huge instrument, but not hitting the right target. So GDPR, I, I think the, you can only understand GDPR properly if you understand that the main target of this is Facebook and Google. So it's an anti-Facebook and Google piece of legislation, but it doesn't hit Facebook and Google, but it hits hundreds of thousands of, of small companies in Europe uh, at the moment. So I think it's not they have this simple because of regulation we have a problem, but it's more we have a problem because we are not actively trying to uh, develop those markets. And one of the symptoms coming out of this is that as we don't develop the markets, we try to mitigate the risks coming with other players entering the European markets by rather European regulatory approaches. That's the argument. Yes, hello. Okay, thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. Um, I'd like to, uh, to ask you first and foremost, uh, how much online uh, processes, I mean, how much, how much uh, online judicial processes are, uh, are handled, I mean, are operating in, in, in Europe in terms of civil cases or criminal cases? Uh, I know that in the US there are lots of digital, digital justice, right? There is now that a trend of, uh, of programs that just uh, handle low, you know, quite easy cases, not, you know, not violent ones, but still uh, uh, online. And I, I just heard that uh, people predict that in about 10 years from now, 75% of, uh, of civil cases will be handled only by computers, yeah. just online. Yeah. So what we can gain from it, it's quite, it's quite clear, but my question is more on, uh, on, on the risks, right? On the dark side that might be at, uh, uh, accompanying to this kind of uh, change. Uh, isn't we, uh, we gonna lose something in this, you know, the personal connection? Um, so what do you think about computers as the judges? Okay, so, so okay, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for the question, and, and, and I need to give a very uh, diverse answer. So the first answer would be when it comes to, to the last part of your question, which is, is it, is, it, is it possible that in Europe a human judge is replaced by a machine, an algorithm? The answer would be most probably no, for legal reasons, because we have Article 22 of GDPR, it's explicitly excluding that a human being may be subject to the decision taken by a machine. So we have a very strong principle leading back to Kant, finally, meaning that no human should be object of a machine-driven decision. So there is already a legal uh, obstacle here, making it, at the moment at least, very, very unlikely that we enter a scenario where the machine decides on human. At the same time, we see all kinds of developments in the world where this is exactly this is already happening, including in Europe, by the way. There are all kinds of machine-driven decisions taken on a daily basis in Europe already now, uh, not necessarily in courts, but, but preparing court decisions and in administrative procedures and so on. Again, causing this this you know this broken law problem that I see. So I'm quite sure that this will come up as a problem, or is already coming up as a problem again in Europe. And the, uh, if we don't change the approach, the approach will be the same one, which is failing law. When it comes to uh, to, to more to, to simpler um, uh, parts of your question, which is in how far do judges on a daily basis use media conferencing, for example, as a tool, or? Electronic, uh, other electronic means in the day to day practice, the answer would be we are again lagging behind, but in this case, mainly for budgetary and, and, and technological reasons, and also because of the, uh, the people driving these developments are late and are old, typically men like me, you know, having a legal background, being 50 plus, not really uh, literate in computing, deciding on budgets. And, and the outcome of this is that, at least in the countries that I'm aware of in Europe, 
um, the, uh, the usage of information technology in courts is very, very underdeveloped in comparison with other countries. When it comes to the risks, um, uh, true, there are all kinds of risks coming, but there are also all kinds of opportunities uh, coming, and the most important one is access to justice. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the easier the approach and the cheaper the approach, the more cases can be dealt with in front of the court uh, that are at the moment lost. So there's a big promise of uh, more efficient, in particular, consumer protection coming with those solutions. I know that uh, uh, in, in this aspect of access to justice, one of the critiques is that you know the literacy is uh it might be a barrier right it mm -hmm. means access to just very specific people that may be at the expense of, of others so. yes true. perhaps this is one of the upcoming job opportunities for young lawyers if they want to be working as a translation service in this field because one of the one of the, the age groups losing in this at the moment are my students so it has become much more difficult for students today to enter a qualified labor market in the world already today uh, than it was for Paris. So perhaps that would be one answer to this. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about the data protection because uh, it struck me that uh, Twitter, how Twitter blocked the uh, Australians of German police and um, I want to ask you what do you think about the idea of forcing the big companies that handle big data uh, to make the algorithm public? Because many of those algorithms, you know, machine learning and uh, even the architects, they have sometimes no idea what is happening, but in order, for example, to check how my that data is is, is uh, uh, transformed and uh, sell to to other companies. Um, some 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 people suggest that in, in literature that uh, what we should do is first step should be to make these algorithms in public that people could yeah. can check. Of course, okay. not regular people, but people who would be able to do it, for example, for the sake of the governments. Mm -hmm. So what do you think okay, about Okay, so this? again, interesting question, however, leading back to some of the issues that I mentioned when I spoke about Barlow. I think the first point would be, those are US companies. Why should European laws apply? Question mark. And we have a quite long tradition in international law, which is the law of the home country of the company should apply and not European law worldwide. That would be so the digital sovereignty problem is a problem. Secondly, coming out of this, imagine a world where Facebook or Google simply, like Google did in China, by the way, would simply stop operating in Europe. I mean, um, I think the impact on Europe would be uh, more uh, or heavier than the impact on Google. <laughs> so those are companies that are too big to fail. Right? It would really harm our society significantly if they simply decided to leave. Second. Third, uh, on the European constitutional law level, I would argue that uh, such an algorithm is part of the intellectual property. We have a long tradition of protecting intellectual property, in particular in Europe, by fundamental rights. And it's not evident that this claim would be successful being made in front of a European court because of the fundamental right protection of Google and others um, in the field uh, that would uh, need to be taken into consideration as well. Uh, and, and, and fourth, uh, coming out of this, uh, this third argument of the uh, intellectual property problem, uh, is perhaps we need to rethink our whole system of fundamental rights. So this is my, my personal thought about this at the moment. So that we, we need to reach many of those fundamental rights come from a very long, I mean some, most of them from the Enlightenment period, right? And, and, and perhaps this, this regime no longer fits properly. And the fifth argument, what we see at the moment is that many of those scholars argue that antitrust law, right? We should now take antitrust law or unfair competition law to deal with these companies. 
I'm not very sure that this will be successful if we don't think about the, the conflict of fundamental rights and, and fundamental values behind those antitrust, uh, unfair competition, data protection, copyright, and so on. And this is something which we've probably lost longer than our lifetime. This is, uh, this is a long-term project. Thank you. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, it's exactly about the GDPR. I don't know whether it is in the field of your research, but as as you said, uh, in fact, GDPR, it is not one law that fits all. I would even say that if we have more than these 50 open clauses that allows for, in fact, 28 different regimes to some extent. For example, in Poland, we have the we have GDPR, we have the law on data protection, mm -hmm. we have more than 200 bills changed, yes. and also we have the church GDPR, the Catholic yeah. Church adopted Same. its own. So Same in other countries. I would even say that the situation after GDPR, it changed, but not so much that we can say that we have one regime. Yes. Uh, probably, my, my question is whether, and then, uh, we have article, for example, Article 82 of the GDPR <coughs> allowing the right for damages, to claim damages, resulting from uh, breaching GDPR. Probably, we, we would still need the applicable law clause in personal data protection because we had one in the directive. There was the clause that which law would be applicable. Yeah. I think then the European legislator thought we have the regulation, so as we have the regulation, we don't need the choice of law clause. But do you think, because this is what I'm thinking about, that we still would need the choice of law clause for uh, GDPR, for the data, data protection rules? This is my first question. And the second, um, it is about the relationship between the privacy rights and personal data protection, because data protection was rooted in privacy, derived from the right of pri the, the, the privacy. But would you agree that at the moment being, uh, we can say that it's separated, that we have two different rights. We have the right to privacy, and we have the right to have our personal data protected. Another, I would say, human right. Yes. So the second answer question is much easier. I would strongly say yes to this, and I would have a very simple and positivistic answer, which would be, there's a distinction between Article 7 and Article 8 in the Charter. Yeah, that's right. And there must be a reason behind this because you can't assume that a legislator wants to regulate one thing twice yeah. and so closely. So I think I would argue very strongly that there is a distinction to be made. However, the details are very complex, as you know, and the Court of Justice, unfortunately, has not been very helpful in distinguishing those two. In particular, in the Google Right to Be Forgotten case, uh, the argument is very unclear whether it's Article 7 or 8 or both of them that are relevant. The first question uh, about the, the conflict of laws issue, um, I think uh, there has been some emphasis on trying to solve the issue, in particular when it comes to the competing jurisdiction of different data protection authorities, with a lot of bureaucracy again coming with this. Um, and I think that, in particular, data protection authorities would not agree that we have a problem in this. Uh, however, I think we do, in particular when it comes to jurisdiction outside Europe. So the, the, the approach, this sovereignty approach issue, and in how far non-European courts, or in how far European courts would be uh, allowed and should be allowed to uh, establishing jurisdiction about data processing outside of Europe, and which one of those uh, is very unclear. Okay. Yes, Bill. Thank you very much for very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, your opinion because there was uh, there were some recommendations for the future for Europe. Um, talking about the uh, gap between United States, China, South Korea, and uh, European Union, and there is the information that we need some, some, some firms which we call European champions. And my question is, do you think that the uh, better way is just reducing the barriers to create this European Silicon Valley, as we can call it, or it is more uh, the situation that we should be, uh, follow the path of China for building this strong public policy 
using the public um, funds, using the public procurement to create this uh, European champions, which can uh, help us to, uh, uh, to to make this gap smaller than, than it's... Yeah, I don't I would not like, I mean, that, that's more political than a legal question, I think. Uh, politically, I would not really want to suggest that we should have a more state-driven approach to this. Uh, my my answer would be we need a different mindset in, in and we need a different we need a different approach when it comes to education and we need to get our younger people more involved into this and more digital whatever that might be. So just one example that I would always like to share in this I have as I said a 15 year old son who has computer science now as a subject finally in school. Uh, the most important work that he needed to write in this computer science class was about uh, risks of uh, his personality rights on the internet in computer science. Right? So this is obviously an important subject. I really adore that he is learning about this, but I would not expect this to be the most important part of his education in computer science. Uh, so we need more computer science in computer science, and we need more computer science in law. That would be more my answer to this. Mm -hmm. So one more general and let's say comparative question, because at the beginning of your presentation, you you uh, claim that that uh, we can observe a kind of uh, in, uh, as you ca called it eroding of state authority uh, in respect of these giants yeah. like Facebook and so on. So my question is. Uh, concerns the scope of this of this claim. So, uh, don't you think that it is the let's say phenomenon that concerns Western world? If you compare it with China, for example, yes. which doesn't have at all the problem with you know exercising authority over there, Russian media, Russian media. Russia yeah. So, so perhaps this is the question of uh, this our let's say. I don't want to, uh, to, to that, that it would sound uh, uh, negatively, but our fixation on, on values, on values that, mm -hmm. that we are so, let's say, determined to protect fundamental values, including uh, uh, rights of, uh, let's say, corporations and, and uh, property and so on and so on, that we are so constrained in, let's say, exercising control over uh, over uh, those companies that we actually have lost uh, an ability to, to, let's say, intervene into into this uh, spontaneous, let's say, development and yeah. and consolidation, let's say, of those of those companies. And it includes not only Europe but also the US, where yeah. where this, let's say, private ownership is is a sacred, yeah. let's say, value in, in law, even more perhaps than than Europe. Yes, I could be, yeah, could be. The question then is what yeah. to do, right? Yes, the question is what to do and, and uh, whether there is a solution that, w whether the price to regain, let's say, state authority over those companies uh, is on a similar level than the Chinese or Russians have, wouldn't come at a price that, that, that is too high to, let's yes. say, we can afford. Because, yes. of course, then it would mean that, that you, you answered to the previous questions that you would be very skeptical against, let's say, state policy of creating, yeah. let's say, this kind of uh, <laughs> uh, companies, that it's better that, not, that it's more, let's say, free, spontaneous process than, than the top-down, yeah. let's say, uh, effort of the state. So according to the same logic, perhaps uh, um, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, 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 regaining state authority would require actually the authority over not only those giants, but actually every company and, and every individual. It's difficult, let's say, to, to get this authority for a state, but to have it limited only to these special two or three yes. uh, IT giants and then let all other companies, individuals, entrepreneurs and so on do whatever they, they want. Yes. True. So, so, so this is the dilemma, I would say, whether, whether we uh, uh, keep the priority of rights and values or, let's say, rather, rather prefer to let the, the, the uh, 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 economic and technological processes be controlled. Yeah, what so, would you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is the question to you. I see this. So now I have much too little to, to yeah. that. So, I, I see the dilemma and I 
So I see the dilemma, and I, I, I see a, a history of European approaches to try to deal with this dilemma, dilemma which is a, a long story of failures. So I could even start somewhere in the 80s when, Europe, when the European Commission started to try to establish a competitor to the TCPIP protocol, which is the internet protocol. Right? So that was one attempt where quite a lot of research money was invested in Europe, millions and billions of euros, or then Deutsche Mark or whatever it was, uh, to try to step, set up a competing system with huge failures, obviously, never successful. So we don't have... We don't have a single example that I would be aware of at the moment where a European public-driven approach to, to establish a technology in a free market has been successful. So take the risk paribus, that means I would be rather reluctant that this will be a successful attempt. Uh, but I, sh I fully share your analysis of the dilemma. So I don't know. I don't but know. but is it, yeah, I guess interesting question in itself, what went wrong? Because if you take into account the very beginnings of the computer technology, uh, just immediately after the Second World War, like the, 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 the theoreticians like Neumann, like uh, yes. Alan Turing, and yes. so on and so yes. on, yes. it was mostly uh, you know, born here in Europe. And then over time, actually, we lost completely that, that momentum of yes. that impetus uh, uh, you know, on, uh, in favor of, of, of other parts yes. of the world. So, so have you, uh, uh, do you have any hypothesis of what was the reasons that, that you know, the, these technologies, you know, simply lost their, their speed, the development lost their speed in, in Europe in comparison with other parts I, of the world? I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really, I don't know. I mean, I'm yeah. not an expert in this, and probably nobody is an expert in this. My, my, my lay person's answer would be, it's the mindset, right? We, are, mm. we, have, we have a problem here in the mindset but, in Europe. But, but the, the, yeah. the important part of this answer, uh, in respect of which you are certainly an expert, is, and to, to, to some extent answered it already, that, that Europe, in your opinion, this is the point of this uh, uh, problem is not inside regulation. This is not the fact that we regulated something wrongly and, uh, uh, let's say, more or less accidentally blocked the development of, of let's no, say, I don't think so. but technologies. I, I, so that's true. I don't think so. But I also think that the, the regulatory approach, which is always uh, advertised in Europe as being third way, right? So the middle way between China and the US did not help at all. Right? It did not help. Yeah, right. Another layman's answer on this one that goes in the same direction as both of you. Um, and I'm looking in particular at the sort of experience of teaching in Canada at McGill versus at Yale in the US and trying to explain to my students things that I took for granted as assumptions, which of course in the US weren't. <laughs> um, you know, things like you have a functioning health system, which you have to keep sort of, you know, <laughs> forgetting that they don't. Um, but when I would buy newspapers in the US about tragedies that occurred, especially involving children, near the border with Ontario, and then I would buy the same story in Canada, the coverage was different universes. Mm. Um, the photographs you could show, even, were different universes. And I was wondering whether maybe that mindset question mm. might come into play in that very simple little example of US um, versus Canadian rules for what you can and can't show in the public space. Um, photographs of children with their heads cut off. You, you, you can't in Canada. You would be, no one would buy your papers anymore and you would be out of business and the regulator would probably you know, be on you. Um, and yet they were easily available selling papers just across the border. And, and, and we saw the same thing when we talked about billboards and advertising. If you own the land, you can show anything you want, naked women, whatever. Whereas in Canada, <laughs> excuse me, that's public space that we're looking at. Um, you take that down. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering whether perhaps um, some of the Canadian media regulations um, as compared to other approaches next door, same language, same people, different values, 
um, might be useful. And I'm thinking of a set of jurisprudence. I am absolutely not an expert in this area. So it, literally a layman's answer who had to study this in law school many years ago, um, where the judges were trying to determine what was unacceptable to the public values. And, and Justice Gonche, who was the first chairman of my board of my research institute at McGill, actually wrote many of those judgments. And he used to talk to me about this. Um, and, and, and I recall him saying, you know, we trust a judge to determine what is in the best interest of a child. We will therefore trust a judge to determine what is pornography. And that's how our system works. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, we have public values, we trust our judges. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that is maybe something that um, it wouldn't break the impasse, but would also explain if you have judges who don't feel that they can intervene here in a way that is logical, maybe you need to be not just training your law students, um, maybe we need to also be training our judges so that they can feel comfortable intervening with the same public trust and the same defense of public values that they already have in many other very contentious areas, mm -hmm. but they are comfortable making that intervention. Mm. Just a question. Yeah, I think I think an interesting point, uh, an argument that I like to make quite frequently, which is we need to have less specific regulation, more fundamental regulation and trust in our judges. Uh, that was not what I see in, in Europe in the last 20 years in this field. The opposite is true. It's less and less general, and it's less and, less and more and more specific. And, 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 and the legislator, in particular the commission, tries to nail down every detail to avoid that judges might have room for interpretation. Uh, I think that's part of the problem, not the solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I have just a comment as a human rights lawyer, um, and well, maybe it is not very popular, but <laughs> uh, well, uh, we uh, we saw at uh, your uh, pictures that uh, on the top uh, there, there are American companies and Chinese companies, yes, and it. I can see a very clear link uh, between. Um, all this technological development uh, and human rights treaties. Uh, China and, uh, uh, and the US are not fans of the human rights treaties and uh, obligations. Uh, in Asia, we, we, we haven't. Uh, and the original system of human rights. Uh, the US, they are not even the party to the uh, Convention on the Right of the Child. Uh, child. So that's, uh, that's the point, I think. So um, maybe we live in the postmodern world and we should select uh, development or human rights. Oh, it's, mm -hmm. it's very sad, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I mean, fair enough, true enough. Um, but what to do then exactly? I read more and more papers in the US, published now in the US, being concerned about that the whole artificial intelligence development uh, is happening in China, not in the US. Right? So even the US are concerned at the moment yeah. that they are lagging behind, uh, in, at least in this technological field. And I think there are quite good reasons to be afraid of this. Uh, the, the question then is what to do. Simply arguing we have the better values and it will not work. Yeah. And interestingly enough, I guess that you know the the Chinese model, if we may call it this way, is precisely something that you argue against. That is state-driven, top-down yeah. development, rather than the American way in which you know it is all left to the market, to yeah. the free initiative, and you know minimal intervention or regulation from the state. Uh, so, uh, so, so uh, first of all. I guess that we can safely say that both those extremes, let's say Chinese and Americans, proved up to now uh, more uh, um, development, uh, 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 mo mo more favorable to development than the European approach. Because you know these statistics and you know ranking of the of the technology giants is, is a proof of, of that. 
But if it is the case really that the Chinese start to have a clear, let's say, um, uh, 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 clearly develop f f faster than, than Americans. Perhaps it is also the, 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 the it suggests also that the model of let's say state-controlled development of at least technology is more effective than than the free market model. Uh, which means that it is a, that lack of the regulation is probably not the key solution. So it is not over regulation certainly uh, that because you know Chinese. China is certainly, let's say, not less regulated. Of course, it's a completely different regulation based on completely different axiology. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. But yeah. nonetheless, it is certainly very detailed, in a very detailed way regulated. Everything that the entrepreneurs are allowed to do yeah. or you know, uh, 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 and the scope of freedom is, is much narrower. So, so perhaps this is not the question of how detailed the regulation is, but rather whether the content of of that, which was, which would bring us back to the question, what's what's wrong in our regulation rather than the problem that we have them at all. Mm -hmm. you know? But this is certainly the the, the, the yeah. question to the experts like you. Yes, uh, well, my answer would again be, I think, look, if we are facing Thomas, with all due respect here, you and me, the problem which is if you've only got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right? Mm -hmm. so as both of us yeah, have a legal right. background, the, the answer we're looking for is always a legal one, which is possibly not the most important one in this. Uh, so perhaps China is simply good in, because it's not, it's not only because of the regulation, but it's simply because of the size and because of knowing where the priorities are and, 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 and having now a long history of, of growth. And all these that Europe doesn't have. So economic answers, yeah. plain economic answers, uh, that, that that would argue for that. Um, and and also perhaps in the US, right? I mean, 50 years of dominance, worldwide dominance in the field uh, is something you can build up on. Right? And, and Europe is, is is missing this. So certainly, uh, regulation and the regulatory approach uh, is something people like us should really think about. Uh, but I don't think that it could be the only answer to it, or not even the most important answer. Maybe this is this. So yeah. The, the, the IB answer. This uh, is all about the money. Yeah. If we compare the situation with the Apple, for example, and even with Elon Musk. First, they got the money from state, mm -hmm. and that was the reason why they developed so so well. Mm -hmm. And if we are looking at the Chinese company, they just receive money yeah. from this because yes. they are the state of the company. But, but this is something uh, 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 that I include into the my meaning of regulation. So the the, the, the regulatory framework in which you can apply for money yeah. from the state to start up certain activities which are promising and so on is a part of this regulatory framework that, that I have. Sure. Mind. So, so in this sense, the, the, and this is uh, uh, the answer that I wanted to give you the, uh, to, to, to your response. That, that of course, regulation is not the the only solution or even the, the leading one. But all the other processes, economic processes, the mindset that we talk so much about, uh, are not independent of, of that. Yes. So they are not appearing like out of the blue, but they are some reflection also of you know, the, how society works based on this uh, broadly conceived regulatory framework that, that somehow manages all those, those processes. Mm -hmm. uh, Heather. Yeah, so um, I want to take the discussion to go a little bit different direction and just to ask you, um, how much or to what extent do you, uh, I mean, European legal research uh, utilizing uh, this kind of data science techniques to analyze, for example, legal uh, documentations or legal, you know, uh, uh, the decisions by judges? Because I know that at least in Israel we have like yes. a trend of using a, like, even machine learning techniques to. Uh, that, that knows to you know to analyze texts and to find terms that just repeat uh, over themselves and things like this. So how much do you, professor, the researchers, do? So that is a that is an answer, a question where I could answer in another presentation. It would take me forty minutes or so to complete. But very brief. So first one, we have a password way also in Europe coming with this called legal text and digitalization and blah blah blah. 
most of them being all the buzzwords, because the typical European lawyer simply lacks of the basic IT skills that you need to understand these developments. There is no, I mean, I'm one of the perhaps five professors in my age group in the whole German community having some kind of plausible argument that I know a little bit about information technology. I'm one of five. Right. The rest is, and even me, I've never formally yeah. studied this, right? So I'm also just, you know, somebody doing this mm -hmm. in my spare time. All the others are specifically trained in their legal field, not having any uh, skills in the other domain. So there is, there, there are plenty of people talking about, you know, uh, how important it is to do interdisciplinary work and to, to get computer scientists zero happening because of lack of competence. That's also very different in Israel as far as I get to have seen. So then we incorporate courses in the first degree. Indeed, the I know. I mean, and this is really important. This is really yeah. true. Not happening in Europe, not even now, right? And, and one of the reasons is because the people don't understand. It's simple. Mm -hmm. If I ask in my faculty who's going to teach computer science for lawyers, there's not a single one knowing this. And the computer scientists tell me, listen, law is interesting, but it's not really where the show is at the moment, right? So you know, why should we deal with law? Right? So, uh, so that is a, a real problem. Second answer um, to this, uh, because of this, uh, the typical fear-driven approach in Europe, again, starts to be dominant. There is even a law now in France bringing you in jail, five years of jail, if you try to write a computer program identifying a judge and comparing the decisions of this judge in comparison with other judges in the field. Right? So not only it is not made, it is even made illegal to do this, <laughs> because it might infringe these judges' personality rights and their protection rights. So this is uh. the most extreme answer I'm aware of. It's in France. If you, if you want to Google this, Google France and Google Tech and, and data protection, you will find it. Um, so again, this is a very good example where we are clearly lagging behind here. And, and, and Israel, as far as I know, the scene in Israel is very much in front in this field for two reasons. First, they have computer scientists working in the law schools, and second, they have a mindset seeing this as a possibility and, um, for growth and not as a threat. Perhaps it is an example and an argument that you know in in uh, facing this uh, rapid development of new technologies, we are simply uh, 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 lagging behind also in the ability to adapt this our human rights framework. That you know, we some, sometimes you know we we apply this old concept of this you know personality, sovereignty, and, and um, privacy, and so on and so without a sufficient flexibility to make them fit to to, to what these technologies are, are all about. And, and this is not the question of you know fidelity to the human rights let's say credo of, of, of Europe, but rather of, of the way in which we are doing it, let's say, blindly and, and not taking into account the differences in, in, in the environment in which yes. many of them have, have to be applied. So, so yes. this is a, a lot of work for human rights lawyers, yes. perhaps. That's why I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? If not, thank you very much.